Hey guys, uh, here is the game that uh, I promised to show you in the blog, the uh, the big matchup between myself and M Chess Pro version 8. Okay, former world champion of microcomputers. Uh, doesn't say much by today's standards when it was in 1995, but it's it's a uh, it's a good challenge for a player who's not Vishyanan like me, right? So let's get cracking. So I'll show you the game. So the game went, I opened with the Queen's Pawn and he played knight f6 and uh, this is the uh the one of the most common moves um um against the queen's pawn uh, the idea is to just uh inhibit white from playing e4 and getting this ideal center right um and it also develops a piece of course right so that cannot be bad um the other option for him is of course d5 which um which is completely playable as well. It also inhibits e4 and um, just puts a pawn in the center and opens a bishop. So both moves are quite good. There's several other options, but they're not quite as good, right? All right, let's, let's get in all that. So now I played knight f3. And this has uh, pluses and minuses, this move. Uh, the most common move here uh, for white is to play c4 straight away. And the idea is to just get a little control over this d5 uh, square and to put the knight behind the pawn um, on the following move. Uh, I mentioned this in my previous video, actually, if you guys have seen it, um, that uh, pawns need to be placed behind, uh, in, in queen's pawn openings, pawns need to be placed behind the c pawn generally. You don't block your c pawn back on the c square, right? So c4 uh, is the other most common move, but that gives black the option of things like this, c5, uh, and white will go d5, and black can have options like even b5, which is called the Benko Gambit, which I think is completely sound for black, and I find it a little bit annoying to play against as white, even though uh, white can generally do okay. Um, so that's why I play knight f3, because it just steers clear of those types of things, for the most part, anyway. <clears throat> so, uh, Mr. Chess Pro plays e6, and I play c4. Again, so now my uh, my pawn is influencing the center, and I can develop my knight behind the pawn on the following move, right? As as mentioned, what the hell? As mentioned, my arrows are having some problems right now. Still getting used to uh, using this software on a Mac. It's confusing. Okay, so b6. This begins what is called the Queen's Indian defense, right? Black's other options were numerous. There's Bishop b4 check which is called the Bogo Indian defense. And there is also uh, the pawn to d5, which is simply a queen's gambit declined, right? Uh, any of these names that I use, if you're not familiar, you can just uh, Google them and some wiki page will come up that tells you what that page is, right? Or some article. And so anyway, so c4, and he played b6, which is um, a pretty good move. Uh, it prepares to develop the queenside bishop straight away, which is often a problem in these queenside openings. Black has the option of putting it on um, on b7 or a6, and uh, often puts it on both squares, and um, and it's reasonably good. You see, both of Black's bishops have reasonable diagonals almost immediately. Uh, this this line was favoured by uh, a guy called uh, Ulf Anderson from Sweden, who's a very strong grandmaster, and also it was played a lot by uh, Anatoly Karpov, which was the twelfth world champion and very very strong player, right? So. And it's good company. So anyway, I played a3. This move uh, simply prepares, what the hell? This move simply prepares to play uh, d5 without allowing black to pin here and indirectly, um, I mean, when my knight's on c3 and like mm, take away some of my control also of the e4 square because now I can play e4, etc. This you get what I'm saying. I just explained it in a bullshit way, right? <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, pretty uh, pretty useful move. This move, A3, was um, very famously played by um, Gary Kasparov, 13th world champion, uh, in numerous beautiful games where he played attacking chess and sacrificed all over their king's side. I'll show you. So, uh, M Chess played bishop b7, I played knight c3. And you see now the point of this <clears throat> a3 move is he cannot play bishop b4, uh, pinning and indirectly getting control of e4 because I've already played a3, right? And so now if he gives me a spare chance, 
I'll play d5 and e4 and get a massive center, right? Um, so now he played the move, which is basically mandatory in this position, d5, right? Um, I had a tournament game against a friend of mine uh, years ago, and uh, it was uh, quite a funny game. He didn't play d5 here and got in big trouble. The game went bishop e7, and I just played d5 as expected, right? And he played uh, d6, you know, I exchanged pawns. I uh, don't need the exchange pawns. I had another friend again who played against the same guy at e4 here, e4 here. Um, but I think d takes e6 is good. No oh, shit, hang on. What the hell? Just a moment. Three, e7, d5, d6, yes. So I play d takes e6, you play f d6. So the reason I play this is because this pawn is going to be a little bit of a weakness now, uh, unless he wants to do a silly move like this, which leaves this diagonal weak, right? So he's sort of got, uh, he's definitely gonna have weak light squares on one side of the board at least. So I played g3 and he castled, I believe. And I play bishop h3, hitting this weak pawn straight away. Hitting this weak pawn straight away, right? He played e5, just getting rid of it. But you see these uh, white squares are super weak now, right? And I castled, and he played bishop c8, and I swapped. And you see now, uh, all of black's pawns bar one are on, or are on uh, black squares. And he has, he doesn't have a white square bishop. Like if this bishop was here, and it might be a different story. His white squares might be able to be saved, but look at all these Swiss cheese like white squares around here that he doesn't have control of, right? I have a feeling that he was probably dreaming up some type of, oops, sorry, some type of attack with queen h3, knight g4, rook takes f3, and mating me on h2, right? But uh, this can only really happen in a schoolboy's dreams, right? Uh, this <laughs> type of attack, it should really be easy to defend, particularly since white has the move. So I played knight d5, and you see the problems are immediately mounting, right? Threatening knight takes e7, threatening knight takes e7, right? Big threat. And one of the big points is that if his knight captures me, if his knight captures me, uh, my queen recaptures check and also grabs this rook in the corner, right? So uh, let's just have a look at that. So if he captures, what the hell? What the hell? Okay, if he captures, I don't know what the hell happened there. Uh, my queen takes back and then you see there are a fork here, right? There is a fork here. And what else can he do against knight d5? Um, the best move is rook f7, after which he will lose an exchange after knight g5, right? Um, so he's already basically losing an exchange. Uh, but the move he played was knight c6, thinking that, uh, you know, this bishop is defended now and he's developed a piece or whatever, but he actually loses a whole piece this time because um, you see this knight is not defended. So I just took on f6 and already on move 13, he resigns because after he recaptures this knight, you see the move, let's see. I, yes, I can play queen d5 check and grab this knight for free, All right? Uh, let's assume bishop takes f6, then queen d5 check, and I just capture. I'm just going to turn these stupid auto arrows off. All right, just a moment. Uh, let me turn that shit off. Uh, it should be under this help stuff. Maybe it's under somewhere else. Let's have a little look ski. Um, oh fuck, 
I don't know. Okay, anyway, moving on. So um, that is why it's mandatory to play d5 here, because black immediately gets some control over these uh, these white squares, right? Does that make sense? So I capture, and he captures with the pawn, which is possible, and it does get very nice control over e4. Um, but most people these days prefer to play knight takes d5 and maintain flexibility in the center. And so you see this bishop doesn't get blocked. And um, white will get a big center, admittedly. But um, black will always have some... or well, the idea is that black will always have some counterplay after some c5 for capturing, right? Um, and of course developing normally. But, I mean, white isn't going to be able to just sit there on his massive center all day, right? Um, so I think Kasparov used to play e3 here. And then something like bishop e7, bishop d3 castles, castles, c5, e4, takes, takes. And this is sort of where they begin from. Like um, white has a big center, but black uh, is going to be putting pressure on the center pretty quickly, right? And whatever, these types of moves and bringing the queen out and centralizing. Um, but the thing is, Kasparov just played some... Um, Beautiful attacking chess. You can look the games up or you can ask me and I'll link you to them. They're really nice But anyway, this guy played e takes d5 just getting control of the e4 square um, The downside of this of course is that this bishop is blocked a little bit, right? Um, so I play bishop g5 uh, Logical move, right? He plays bishop e7 play e3. This is all very logical development, right? Castles and I play bishop to b5 This move is a little bit funny, right? Um, it's actually a novelty, uh, previous moves had been, uh, rook c1, which is quite logical. Rook c1, what the hell is wrong with this mouse? Rook c1, and also, uh, which is quite logical, putting the rook on the semi-open file. And also bishop d3 is a logical move. Uh, the idea of my move, bishop b5, is, um, of course I'm going to go back to d3, but the idea is to provoke a weakness first, right? If one of these pawns kicks me, then I come back to d3 and later that pawn will be a little bit unhappy to be on that uh, advanced square, right? And uh, that's the point behind it. So h6 was played, attacking my bishop, and I just come back. Um, by the way, a swapping there is possible, but I don't, I'm not really a fan of these types of positions where you swap, now let's say castle. See, now I've given him the two bishops and immediately he can play c5. And you see, I don't really want to take here, and I don't, don't really want to take here and make his bishop a monster, right? And um, if I don't, he's just going to start kicking me around. He like a6, and my bishop comes away, and then he goes knight c6 and puts more, more pressure on these fucking arrows are pissing me off. Knight c6, putting more pressure on d4. And uh, I will probably miss my dark squared bishop, right? So that's why I kept it. He plays c6. This is a move I was looking for because when I come back to d3, now uh, this bishop is even worse. And of course, later, this pawn might be a bit of a weakness, right? So uh, he plays knight bd7 and I castle. Um, and okay, so he plays rook e8. Uh, apparently, the best move here, which is quite standard in this type of position, is to play knight e4, which is logical. Um, so then I'll capture on e7, he recaptures. And uh, now if I capture on e4, it's not so good for me. So probably I just play queen c2, and he'll play f5 maybe. And I think black is already okay here, right? Um, it's not better, but he's probably okay. So... Uh, that is the best move. He played rook e8, which is a very logical move, just putting his own rook on the semi-open file, right? Uh, and I play rook c1. All uh, completely, completely logical chess. Uh, and now, again, he should play that knight e4 idea, which is just as good in this position. But he plays a5. Um, this is a interesting positional move, as mentioned in... Um, the wiki page about this computer 
it's based on complex pattern recognition, whatever that's supposed to mean. I know what pattern recognition is, but what makes it complex, I'm not sure. But uh, so the idea of A5 has, it has a couple of points in my view. Um, one is to stop white from going B4, right? And the other B4, stopping white from playing B4, yes. And the other one is to facilitate uh, a possible future exchange of this stupid bishop on b7, right? Um, which is both logical, right? Both logical ideas. Um, the problem is that because I provoke this c6 move, um, this pawn becomes a weakness, and that actually becomes a very deciding thing in this game, right? Um, not that I'm saying I won or anything. Uh, so I play bishop b1. Let's see bishop back to b1. This move uh, looks a little bit weird. When I was learning, I was wondering why people put the bishop back there, but it's actually quite a good square because bishops are long-range pieces, right? And so it doesn't matter if you tuck them back here, they can still fire all the way across the board, right? All the way across the board. So if I, for example, at some point put my queen on c2, I might be able to create some mate threats on h7, right? Uh, not with the knight defending, but you know what I mean. I can try to deflect the knight on f6 or something. So now he played bishop a6. It's a smart move, right? It, uh, I took my bishop off this diagonal. Right? I took my bishop off this diagonal, so he takes the diagonal. It's a very logical idea. And so you can't really knock it. It's pretty good. So I... Fuck these arrows. So I play rookie one. And... Now, what, 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 what can we say about this position? Um... I think positionally, black is absolutely fine, except for this tiny weakness on c6, right? Which was provoked by my novelty, uh, bishop b5, earlier in the game. So uh, now he makes his critical mistake of the game, a move that I think is ridiculous. I'm not sure what complex pattern recognition it was, this was based on, but um, I guess some people would do this. It makes sense if you think about it from a human perspective. I mean, uh, I, I think the most logical move would be uh, rook to c8, right? Because um, it just defends this weakness, and at some point, maybe he can play c5. Right? That makes sense, right? Um, the move he played was g6. And this move, uh, it makes kind of sense uh, if he has enough time to uh, organize himself. I believe the plan is, um, firstly, he, he blocks this bishop. And I believe his plan was to bring the bishop around to g7, where it's going to be on a good diagonal after he plays c5, right? Which is pretty sophisticated. This is um, a smart computer program, right? But um, this gives me the idea for an instant uh, attack. So I play knight e5. See, this move, I think, can probably be accompanied by an exclamation mark. Uh, the reason why is because immediately it's... Uh, it takes advantage of his uh, his weak weaknesses in his position, right? Okay, of course, firstly, this guy. But if he defends it, let's say, in a passive manner like this, there are also some possibilities of just sacrificing a piece over here. I mean, it's not winning... But it might be very dangerous for him. Takes, takes, bishop takes, and then maybe some pawn advances and tuck the king over to h1. Might not be too safe um, for him. And that's only one option. I can do other follow-up moves like f4 or something. Um, so that's why he basically has to take it instead of playing rook c8. So he took, and I took, and now he plays knight d7. And the point is that uh, after I exchange on e7, takes takes and f4 white now has a very nice advantage um, because this g6 move that move was only useful if he actually can tuck his bishop back to here if he can actually tuck his bishop back to here but now that the bishop's gone he simply just has some weaknesses around his white around his dark squares here right so um, white has attacking prospects on the king side now uh, so white's position is a little bit better, uh, simply because white has no weaknesses, really, and black has weakness here, and also uh, some weaknesses around his king as well, right? 
Uh, I could even follow up with some h4, h5 idea to weaken him a little bit more. Um, so he played knight c5, which is logical. He's, uh, his knight and bishop are coordinating a pr r pretty well, right? Um, so now I play another move, which I think is probably um, worthy of an exclamation mark. I'm not going to be too liberal with giving myself exclamation marks, but I think it's a very nice idea anyway. Um, so if you look at this, uh, there's there's a rule in um, some Russian chess teaching or something that uh, is called Mokoganov's rule, right? Mokoganov said, when there's a position where... Uh, you have not much to do. You should look at your minor pieces and even all of your pieces and say which one is the crappest, basically, right? And right now, this knight here, in my opinion, is not so good. This is not so good. And I would like to... Because um, I, I can also see this d4 square is beautiful uh, for putting a piece on as well. And so... Also, another point, obviously, is that this c6 square is one of his primary weaknesses, right? Right here. And so I played knight e2, of course. And the point is just to play knight d4 and uh, start targeting him. And it's, the knight can also support some f5 advances too. So that's quite a nice move. I think the best move for him here would have been just to take that knight and I capture back. And then he plays a4 preventing me from playing b4 and this would be an interesting position um i think i would still stand better here because my bishop is quite a good piece especially after uh trying to organize some attack like i can start bringing pieces over to the king side or something and uh, his knight can't even interrupt uh my play because he has to always watch out for all these pawn weaknesses around here right so uh, visually, Black's doing okay, but his position's sort of barely holding together. So, anyway, he played Queen C8. This is a, a serious mistake, in my opinion. He should get rid of this knight before it comes to a good square. But I have a feeling that uh, the programmer um, excuse me. I have a feeling that the programmer weighted uh, bishops a little bit more highly than knights, and so. Um, didn't uh, capture on e2 here. Uh, this this is uh, not like some computer error or something. A lot of humans do this too. They uh, they weigh bishops more highly than knights. They say, oh, bishops are worth 3.5, so I'm not going to swap, right? But this is a very rigid uh, stance to have because um, because bishops and knights' value changes constantly. It's a, it's a it's a um, variable factor. In, and it changes every few moves based on the position, right? It can change anyway. It's a, it's not a permanent uh, situation on the board, right? So um, now that I get to play knight d4, I think white has a clear advantage, right? A clear advantage because um, you see now I'm permanently putting pressure on this, and we see that there's some for, there's some pins happening on the c file here as well. Right, so um, this is a serious issue. I'm threatening the move b4, which will just make the knight move and then capture on c6, and then his position will just collapse straight away, right? So uh, now he should play a4, just uh, preventing b4 and just sitting on his bad position. White's still clearly better uh, because black has no play and white can just slowly build up on the king's side. Some attack like h4 probably is a good start. Sorry, just a moment. h4 is probably a good start. h4, h5, take some stuff and create some weaknesses over there. Meanwhile, black can do nothing, right? Because his queen side is basically frozen. These pieces look good, but the fact that they can't really do anything um, is an important factor, right? But instead of playing a4 there, he played bishop c4, which simply does nothing. He's trying to throw an extra piece onto the C file to break that pin, right? Um, but that doesn't help at all. After B3, white is simply winning uh, because the bishop has to move. And after the bishop moves, let's say bishop back to A6, then I play B4 anyway. And when the knight moves, I just capture on C6 and his position collapses immediately, right? The D5 pawn will be hanging, that rook will be hanging. There will be some discoveries where the queen will be hanging to the rook 
And so he really can't allow that to happen. So the best thing to do in this position is to give me two pieces or to basically t take a pawn for his piece. So takes, takes, and c5, right? So I just want a piece, right? Because of that pressure on the c file. Uh, can you believe what happens in this game? So this knight is now a very bad piece. It can't come forward. And what the f yeah, this, this knight is now a very bad piece. It can't come forward. And remember McCoganov's rule, imp improve your worst piece. So just e4 first, uh, because uh, he he's down a piece, but he has uh, one, two, three, four four pawns against a couple over on this side, a little bit of a rolling majority. So uh, I like this move e4 first to try to undermine his pawns. Uh, one obvious point is that he can't play d4 here because this bishop would drop. So it's a little bit of a tactical point, right? He plays queen d7 and I exchange pawns happily, right? And now, like I was saying, the Mokoganov rule, the knight's not very good. So knight d2 and simply I bring the knight back where I can improve it, right? Uh, this is basically going to force him to capture my bishop because after, let's say, rook d8, which he played, knight e4, um, the threat of knight f6 is so great that he must capture. And remember, exchanging pieces helps the def uh, helps the attacking, helps the winning side, basically. So bishop takes, bishop takes. And now, simply, I'm a piece up for what? He has six pawns, I have five pawns. I'm a piece up for one pawn. I should be winning comfortably here, right? Um, within 28 moves, it's quite crazy. Since, I mean, when you consider that uh, this software on much slower hardware was beating GMs back in the days. But anyway, you play queen d2. Um, and uh, of course, I'm happy to swap queens. This is an end game with a piece up. I mean, whatever. Now, I was tossing up between two moves here. Uh, rook b1 was my first choice, basically, um, because I can just pressurize this pawn all day long, right? Like, uh, he defends it, and then I can just... I think my plan was rook e3, followed by rook here, and just catch, capture the b pawn. It looks very easy, right? But I kept panicking about this uh, counterplay here. Right, one um, friend of mine who's a very strong trainer, he said to me, why do you always try to hold their hands, right? What he means by that is I'm always trying to prevent everything, right? So uh, instead of uh, playing rook b1 and allowing him to play this rook a2 idea, I decided I will swap it first, right? The problem with this is it gives him a little bit more time. So for example, he takes, I take, and he gets to play b5. And obviously I'm still completely winning here, but I don't know what the hell I was thinking. Uh, so rook b1, b4, takes, takes, and rook a1. This is a good move, right? Just threatening to take this pawn for free. Now a move like rook a7 would, not f rook b7, rook a7, would be not a very good move. Ugh, these arrows are fucking useless. Uh, yeah, rook a7, I'll just fucking put the piece there. Rook a7 would not be a very good move because he's simply frozen, he can't do anything now. His rook's tied to the pawn. I can simply just, you know, go here and bring my king over and win quite comfortably, right, most likely. Um, but he played a, a better idea. Plays rook c7. Gaining a tempo attacking my bishop, right? And then uh, I move the bishop and he plays rook c3. So he's gaining time, gaining time. So instead of defending his pawn, he's counterattacking, which is not bad. So I play rook b1. Uh, he plays king f8. And I play h4. Uh, the idea of h4 was a little bit sneaky. My idea was to play h5 and capture here and give myself a passed pawn on e5 right and if he captured me i simply go and get it i go king h2 g3 king h3 king h4 and at some point capture pawns and win the game right 
This guy Smart just stops all that nonsense with h5, but another thing that h5 does is puts another one of his pawns on a white square, right? So if I ever get to capture this one, it's going to be a domino effect, right? Uh, so now I play king h2. He plays king e7, g 3 f6. Smart strategy, trying to swap pawns when you have, uh, when you're on the losing side, trying to swap pawns in an endgame is generally good. He takes, uh, I, I take, he takes back. And so now it's becoming harder to win this position um, because I'm kind of passive, right? I need to get my pieces active as quick as I can. So king h3, king f5, bishop a4. Rook a3, bishop c2 check here, and I try to swap the rooks. Of course, if I get to swap the rooks, it's completely winning, so he doesn't allow that. Okay, two, and bishop b1. Now, I was <laughs> secretly hoping he will play rook here, which is a ridiculous move, but the point is then um, his rook is trapped, strangely enough, right? So I can just... Bring my king over now. Let's let's say he went rook a1. Then I can just bring my king over. And it's going to be an easy win, right? Uh, but of course, he's not stupid. So rook f2 keeps his own rook active and keeps my king out. But on the other hand, I get to improve a little bit. Bishop e4. Bishop c6. You notice that... I'm taking great care not to allow his pawns to move forward. Probably a little bit too much care, right? Rook f2, bishop b5, king f5, rook d3. So and his pawns still can't move, but in the last several moves, I have completely changed um, the situation of my pieces. They've become active, right? So I can finally start targeting his weaknesses. Right, with without allowing his pawns to go forward too quickly. King e6, check, check, and he plays king f8, and I play rook e6. And see now, it should be pretty easy. I can attack weaknesses from both sides of the board, and if he goes uh, king g7, I can simply attack this guy. Right. Maybe even stop this guy from moving first and then go bishop d3, something like this. Uh, so I play rook e6, as I said. He plays a4. I take the pawn. He goes rook c2. I play bishop e6. Now, again, this should be completely winning, right? I just need to deal with these pawns. Um, and so b3, they're getting a little bit dangerous, right? Uh, I play rook g5, which is a shit move. Um, my, my idea was to allow his pawn to get to here and then put my bishop on a2, a2, you fucker, a2. And then simply capture the pawn when he gets there and let him recapture me. Let's assume his rook goes here. And uh, and then just put my rook behind his remaining pawn. And then the rook and pawn ending is very easy. Right? Um, because I'll have captured this pawn by then as well. So let me give an illustration of what I'm talking about. So let's say uh, he goes b2. This is what I was expecting. Bishop a2. And then let's say rook takes h5. What the hell? Oh, sorry. He plays rook c1. This is what I was expecting. Rook takes h5. b1 takes, takes. Then rook b a5. Rook a1. And of course, this is just ridiculously easy to win this position. Now, uh, keep in mind that I don't give myself extra time or any of this cheating stuff. I try to cheat it as a real game, and so I was actually getting pretty low on time at this point as well, and it was very hard to calculate everything in this ending. It was driving me crazy. 
So, uh, but it dawned on me that, of course, in this line, I wouldn't have time to take his H pawn because he will have, instead of just promoting straight away, he'll play rook a1 first and kick my bishop out and then get a, get a whole queen, right? And then I was like, oh, let's hope I'm not just losing here suddenly. That would be the swindle of the century, right? So uh, after rook c1, I can't take his h pawn because if I take this, he just goes rook here. And suddenly my bishop uh, is in trouble and he's going to promote a pawn faster than me, which sucks. So I realized that I can't allow that. So I play rook g8 check, king here, and put my rook here. Right, and this is already not bad for him. Uh, he could have actually won the game here with some sneaky trick, uh, which is depressing when seeing the analysis. Uh, he played rook a1, which is expected, right? Which I expected too, but there's a sneaky trick where he goes rook here. Check. The point is to bring my king to the second rank so that when he comes back here, and I take here. He can take here. And in my original analysis with the king on h3, I can now play rook b5. Or rook b4, sorry. Right? But in this line with the king on g2, he plays b1, discovered check. <laughs> right? So that's the point of rook h1. So I was very deep and the computer missed it. Right? So, uh, and a lot of humans would miss that too, obviously, right? So, uh, rook a1, uh, I take this pawn, and now I expected um, him to queen. No, I didn't. What did I expect here? I expected him to, yeah, queen, that's right. I expected him to queen here, and then I have to take the queen, and then he takes my rook, and then I play bishop g6, attacking this pawn here. And he goes rook a5, defending it. I play f5. And this position will probably be a draw. The bishop takes this and there's with two pawns. If they're not flank pawns, it's, it's actually quite often a win for the pawns and bishop side. But I think on the flank, you can probably draw, right? Uh, that's what I expected. But of course, he has a, a tactic here, just rook takes pawn. Or rook takes bishop, sorry. And then if I take his rook, then he promotes, right? That was a bit of a cold shower when I spotted that he could do that. So rook b4 still, he can't take his rook, but this still definitely isn't losing, right? Um, I'm still a pawn up actually in this rook ending. So king d6, he's activating his king. One downside of this position is that I can't bring my king out at all because he promotes with discovered check, right? So I'm kind of trapped in there. Rook b5. King c6. By the way, another another point is he can't bring his king too far away uh, because I'll start moving this pawn up, right? Um, and if his rook moves, then I take this pawn. So his, his pieces are still a little bit tight. It's probably like a positional draw or some shit like that, right? So king c6, rook b8, king c7, rook b5, or rook b4. You can sort of sense a draw coming here now, right? Play king d6, and I play g4. Now, if he takes that pawn then I am probably winning, right? Of course, I didn't expect him to. Uh, I expected the move on the board. Check, king here, rook here. And I still thought I should be able to be better here because I thought if he takes here, then I go king g3 and recapture and I got two pawns running, right? But, uh, but at the moment, uh, he's threatening this promotion again, right? So I can't take this pawn on h5. So I play king f3, check. And now it would be nice to be able to play king e4 here, right? But that would meet a nasty surprise. King e4 would allow rook a4, a nice little move, just deflecting my rook and promoting his pawn, right? So I have to go back to g2. And so this draw just repeats. Okay, so the game ended in a draw after I was winning straight out of the opening early middle game, right? So that's, I was 
pretty disappointed, but when you consider it's the, uh, you know, a legendary computer program, it's not too bad, but disappointing anyway, just because um, I should be able to convert those endings, right? I'm sure most of you, a lot of you guys would be able to convert that ending, so uh, time trouble is a bitch, right? Um, especially what move was, were those critical decisions to be made, like in the, in the 50s or something? Uh, yeah, anyway, whatever, whatever. I mean, no excuses. Uh, there was a nice little resources that it found at the end. This is another reason why we should never um, let past pawns get too far down the board, even if you are winning, right? So, interesting game. Uh, MTS Pro, Pro uh, it played okay, uh, but I'm not, it's, it is a positional style as it was described, but it's not really an attractive style, so I'll probably be spending more of my training time with other engines in the future. So um, I hope you guys like the video and I'll catch you in the next one. See you later.